All right, I think we're ready to jump into the meat of what you're here for today. So I will turn things over to Duke Ryder. Um, I will let Duke talk in more detail about what, what his particular role is at ASU, but I will just say that he is the mastermind behind the 10 Across concept and the initiative. Um, and we've been incredibly grateful to, to work with him. Um, Arizona State University has been a wonderful partner, and uh, I think we expect them to be a long-term partner in this initiative. So, uh, Duke, I'd like to welcome you up here. Thank you. That's out of your way. I'm just going to say a couple of words uh, to thank everyone uh, before my panelists come up. Um, you're probably wondering, Arizona State University, what are we doing here? All right. <laughs> Uh, I spent 10 years of my life in New Orleans, know the Mississippi River well, I've spent almost 15 in the desert. The conversations that we are having about water are not identical in terms of uh, content, but they are very much parallel in terms of format and the issues before us. You heard the governor register that, you heard the same from the mayor. Um, when I first approached John, D John Davey, sitting in the middle here, who hasn't gotten enough credit, I think, yet today, but he should, uh, at the Baton Rouge uh, Area Foundation, and said, you know, we should do something together. And we think the other cities on the 10 are on the front lines of the major issues of our time. We should start forming incredible partnerships. We should think about uh, what this can be as an entity and how to work together. Uh, and so whether it's water, which I think is an existential issue, and so that's where we're starting, but immigration, global trade, given the ports that are uh, along the 10, uh, governance, you're seeing examples of it today. Uh, all these issues are in their highest relief, in my opinion, on the 10 and in this quarter. So what we do here, I think, will be representative of what the whole country has to do. So that's the background for this, uh, this summit, uh, what's behind uh, 10X. Uh, and with that, I want to invite my fellow panelists up, uh, Henry Cisneros, along with others. Uh, let's see, Alex is here. And we're going to move the podium. Right. Okay. So um, we're going to kick this off with a panel that gets after the really uh, big issues here. And we have uh, purposefully invited uh, uh, three uh, folks who represent different sectors, uh, the public sector, the private sector, an NGO, about not just water, we'll get to water, but what's our capacity for taking on the big issues of the day? They're all, just this week, I mean, global trade is in the news relative to what's happening with our, with China. Uh, water is obviously always with us. Energy is in the news. Uh, it, so we think the 10 represents an opportunity to address these. Probably no one knows more about the role of government than my colleague to the left, Henry Cisneros, who has been a mayor where a lot of problems get taken care of, who has been a secretary. Uh, and so I would like to kick it off, uh, uh, Secretary Cisneros, with you talking about our ability to take these big challenges on and where they might best be resolved. At what level? Well, Duke, first of all, let me thank you and the organizers of this conference. It's, it's, it's nothing short of brilliant, and I use that word advisedly, to link up the cities of the 10. There's all kinds of efforts across the country to create kind of regional compacts and alliances and, 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 and group places together so they can learn from each other and work. But when Duke talked to me first about two years ago about the idea, it just all of a sudden clicked when you connect Los Angeles, Phoenix, Tucson, uh, Las Cruces, El Paso, San Antonio, uh, Houston, Baton Rouge, New Orleans, Mobile, uh, Tallahassee, and Jacksonville. How's Very that? Very good. That's pretty good. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> <laughs> and, all, and all the places and in between. And all the places in between. And the places that abut those, because they're, they're very important places off of, the, off of the 10, but not far off the 10. And you, you look at that and you see uh, four of the 10 largest cities in America, in Los Angeles, San Antonio, Houston, and yes. Phoenix. And you see huge ports that command trade, like the port of Los Angeles and the port of Houston, and the ports along the Mississippi River and 
Baton Rouge and also uh, New Orleans, and then Jacksonville in the east. I mean, there's just so many things that, that pull this together. I so, yeah. I, I, I shouldn't interrupt the secretary, <laughs> but when I first presented this idea to Henry, uh, we had an incredible conversation. I got one of the nicest handwritten notes, <laughs> a lengthy handwritten note about this concept and why we should do it in an era where we don't have time to check the email that, that's coming in every day, for someone to sit down and, and, and go through the possibilities of this and offer that. I just want to thank you publicly for that. I, I well, that it's, it's, because you, it's because I'm sincere. I mean, you have a real, you, you came up with a really good concept here. And of course, this place, to, ch to choose Baton Rouge for the first of those conferences, which will hopefully be annual or more frequently than annual in the years to come on other subjects, uh, is appropriate given that the first subject matter for the first of these conferences is water. Um, on the subject of kind of organizing for leadership on big subjects, I think the country is ready for people uh, uh, dealing with the big problems of our time. But it's going to be different than it's been at any previous time. It's not going to be governmentally led. It's not going to be the federal government doing things top down. It's not going to be local governments acting alone. It's going to be alliances alliances of the public and private sector working together. And it's gonna to have to be very thoughtfully and carefully done with a lot of respect for the roles of different entities and listening very carefully. Bill Ochi, who's a professor of, uh, in the business school at UCLA, wrote a book a few years ago he called the M-Form Society, which, which, which the M stands for the word matrix, that almost everything we do has multiple dimensions and has to be thought of in a matrix format, and he said, in our time, uh, individuals uh, cannot get things done individually anymore, uh, but individuals can block things from happening. So one of the things I learned as mayor was to listen very carefully to find out who's going to be off base, because that's the person you need to, to you know, talk to, persuade, and bring in if you want to get things done. And although as the mayor knows, you know, you, you, your, your, your time is very precious in a leadership role, and you are expected to deliver with almost every hour of your life. There are many hours when you can't deliver. You just have to listen, and it's going to pay off in the long run when you can bring somebody aboard in a consensus kind of style. So that, I think, is going to be different in terms of the way we do leadership going forward. One of my heroes uh, during the period that I was mayor was the governor of Arizona, Bruce Babbitt, in that day. And Babbitt faced horrendous problems in Arizona of water shortage. The farmers and the rural areas were at odds with the cities. The city of Phoenix was growing to the sixth largest city in the country. And, and Babbitt, who later, of course, became Secretary of Interior, but at the time, his number one issue was how to generate a sharing of water resources in Arizona. And he told me a story of how he tried to put a work group together, and he said, I'd like you to come to a 9 o'clock meeting. And people were so opposed that they said, well, we can't make a 9 o'clock meeting. And he said, well, then let's do it at 7. And they said, no, 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 we all have breakfast and we're tied up at 7. He said, the first meeting of this task force will be at 5 in the morning. I know you don't have conflicts at 5 in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> but the, that was the emphasis he put on getting all of the stakeholders in the room to talk to each other, and the result was a substantial and important Arizona water strategy that made it possible for the growth, urban growth to occur, even as the farmers got the water that they need. We faced similar issues in San Antonio, we're the largest city in the country to draw its water from an underground aquifer, and uh, again, the sharing of water between, uh, in, in the west, farmers, in the center, San Antonio and the urbanized area, and to our east, beautiful springs that would be destroyed environmentally if the water was sucked out by irrigation in the west before it ever made its way east. And so again, we, we, we created a series of meetings and task forces that worked for years in order to get state legislation in the end that sort of uh, 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 regulated the amount of draw that could be taken from the aquifer. So Duke, that probably says more than you wanted in the initial uh, response, but the water Water is an appropriate place to start this conversation when we talk about an alliance like the 10 in Los Angeles, 
severe water conservation measures. We know the classic fight in California over water in the north, insufficient in the south. I've mentioned the Arizona crisis. That could extend over into uh, New Mexico and West Texas. San Antonio, it's aquifer. Here, the water issues are different, obviously. The governor made that clear. I just finished a service on a group called Risky Business, which looks at the, the, the business risk calculations of environmental problems. And the number one most impacted places for climate change, water rise, and severe flooding because of violent storms in the country, even though there's serious issues in Miami and Norfolk and New York with Hurricane Sandy and so forth, the number one high risk places are Houston and New Orleans and coming up the Mississippi River. So that's a different set of water issues, but appropriate to start the conversation with water. Right. So thank you for that endorsement for alliances. And we'll come back to examples of people coming together, entities coming together that you think uh, demonstrate the potential to do that very effectively in a time where sometimes we're doubting our institutions. So thank you very much for the kicking that off, uh, Secretary Cisneros. I want to turn now, I, I could go right to risk since uh, you, you had a segue there, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leap over Alex and go to Kaki uh, to talk, uh, get her uh, uh, input with regard to uh, the Nature Conservancy's perspective on these issues. By the way, I'm assuming you all have, because it's been beautifully put together, great biographies of all the panelists, they're right in front of you, so I'm, I'm skipping right over that so we can get into substance. But we invited Kaki here to represent the Nature Conservancy, who has done enormous work here in the Gulf. But I want to kick it off with you to think about how an organization of the scale and scope of yours decides where to be, what to be doing, and how you know you're having an impact. So. Well, the... Uh First, let me add my thanks to the sponsors of this event and everyone for turning out. It's always, I'm all, I grew up along the Gulf Coast, so it's always nice to be near the Gulf Coast in, the, in my stomping grounds. So the Nature Conservancy is, you know, we're very much a science-based institution, and the science we continue to do keeps pushing us to work at bigger and bigger scales. Um, because the, the challenges of nature are the challenges of people. They're one and the same. And so that leads us to work at very massive scales like the Colorado River Basin or the Mississippi River or the Gulf of Mexico. And just like Henry was saying, it's just like when you begin to work at those scales around problems that are at the intersection of nature and people, it necessarily leads to alliances and partnerships and all of that. Um, it's just like no one can act alone and really make any, I think, meaningful difference um, in this um, hyper-connected world that we live in. The, the, one of the things I, the other thing TNC always thinks about is based on the science, not just of our organization, but across the country, is that, you know, the changes are coming faster. Climate change is accelerating the changes. And so whether you're going to be, have, you know, bigger droughts in the west, more water in the east, it's going to get worse. Um, so we know the trends and our understanding of this is also accelerating. You know, so the work done here um, at the water campus and the Institute of River Studies and all across the Gulf and in Arizona State University is just like, so changes are accelerating, our ability to understand them is accelerating because we know technically how to solve a lot of these problems. Where we're not keeping up yet is our ability as a society to make these joint decisions is not accelerating as nearly as quickly as it needs to. And so really it's, I don't think these issues are a knowledge or technical problem. It's how do we come together to solve these problems together? Because government has a role, the private sector has a role, and the nonprofit sector has a role, and we have to all be pulling together if we're gonna get after these big issues. And so I also agree uh, with Henry's comment of it's, um, government has a role to play, but I think it looks different in the future, and it's more of an all-in sort of thing. You know, so for a while, you know, when I was growing up, it was like democracy was you voted and you paid your taxes. I used to work for government for a long time, and they'd call me up, I've paid my taxes, and I'm like, okay. Um, the, but it's just like, I wonder if this is a resurgence of democracy where everyone understands that they are part of the solution, 
And it's more about than just voting and it's more than just paying your taxes and making your voice heard. It's just like we all have to be part of the solution if we wanna solve some of these big challenges at a pace and scale that are going to keep up with the changes we're seeing. So Keki, if, if what you said is true and I have no doubt that it is, I think we have the solutions before us. Mm -hmm. It's whether we can get there right. collectively. So it, within the TNC, where, and, and it's great to hear from the governor on down, people mentioning the role of science, which is also sometimes being questioned of late, that we're gonna do things on a fact -based, uh, in a fact-based manner. How much of TNC's time is spent on those solutions and the technical problems versus now the political or decision-making challenges or collective will challenge? We still, we do both. Uh, we have uh, continued to, of course, protect our core uh, body of science and being able to make sure that we are being led by the science and making sure that we're doing, working strategically in a way that's gonna make the biggest difference. We are continually increasing our capacity and ability to work in the political sectors or in more of the public forum sectors. TNC has a rich history of trying to be um, like an honest broker and, an, and a convener. Uh, one of our trustees often says, she goes, yep, TNC, she goes, when we pull people together, she goes, not everyone work, walks away happy, but everyone walks away heard. And I'm like, oh, I kind of like that. And so it's, it's not that everyone's gonna walk away happy, but everyone has to walk away heard. And so it's, um, that, that is a growing part of the, the work of the Nature Conservancy, is how can we be part of the community trying to reach these bigger solutions. Great. So one of the other things that we wanted to bring together in this conference was, and this building and the institute here and everybody who works in it represents that. We are rapidly running out of excuses for not doing the right thing because we know what's going on. We have technologies and tools that visualize for us, and you will see some spectacular demonstrations of that this afternoon, uh, both on stage here and when you see the model. Therefore, if you know what's happening and you know how it's being caused, what will you do about this? Probably nobody keeps a closer eye on what's happening and what needs to be done and the consequences of not doing that than Alex and Swiss Re. And so when we talk about we know what to do, but w some of us are going to act on that. And if you run a company like theirs, you're going to make some decisions based on what we know. So Alex, uh, tell us about what you do. And we had a, a wonderful conversation talking about risk. How you observe all of this. Well, thanks. Um, quite the intro. Uh, yeah, so for, for those that may not know, so uh, I mean, obviously, you know um, the secretary, you know the Nature Conservancy. Uh, Swiss Re is a 155-year-old reinsurance company, and by and large, what that means is we provide insurance for insurance companies, right? So when they accumulate too much risk on their balance sheet, they look to the global market, and, uh, and they buy reinsurance from us. So when the really big, bad things happen, that's when we step in. So uh, last year, if you think about the consequences of, of the hurricanes, the wildfires, and the earthquakes in Mexico, uh, collectively the industry lost about $140 billion. Uh, but if you add up the total cost of the disasters last year, it was well over $300 billion. And so the insurance and reinsurance industry only plays, uh, you know, I feel like a, a, a small but meaningful role in, in recovering from those disasters. But, but as you point out, um, we, we need to be the early warning system for risks as they evolve. We're the canary in the coal mine. We've had a chief climate change officer on staff within our company since the 1980s. Um, because we have to not understand how the next rainstorm, hurricane, or drought is going to manifest itself. But what does that look like in the context of our evolving uh, civilization and society uh, in the next 25 to 50 years? We had developed something called what we refer to as sonar so that we can identify emerging trends around the globe. You might have one incident in Vietnam or Colombia or in Baton Rouge, and in isolation you might just think, okay, that was just a weird thing that just happened. But if we see them popping up in random spots across the globe, we start paying attention. And we haven't been able to quantify the risk yet, but we want to watch it carefully and, and understand how it, uh, how it evolves over time. Um, and if you think about, again, the cost of these disasters, we see that the cost is going up. That's, that's obviously clear to everyone that's in this room. 
what is making us uh, uncomfortable and something that we feel is our societal duty to help fix is the fact that the differential between the portion which is insured and the actual total cost of disasters is diverging dramatically. So 70% of disasters globally are, 70% uh, of the cost is uninsured. And that falls on the back of the rest of society, right? That falls on the back of individuals, businesses, overwhelmingly government. And we certainly see this here in the United States. If you think about Hurricane Harvey, only 20% of Harvey was actually insured. We're talking about the fourth largest city in the largest insurance market in the world, and only 20% was borne by the private market, and the rest falls on the back of society. We know the answers. We know how to fix these problems, and yet uh, we are slow to make those changes. And, and you will hear, I see my good friend Bill Fulton in the back of the room, you're gonna hear from specific people about cities like Houston and the effect of having only 20% of, of that uh, area covered by insurance. Uh, and we'll go into that a little bit deeper. People may not quite understand how you observe the world though. You, you said something wonderful to me, that risk is random but predictable. You well, know, two things that would seem to diverge, but it's a great way to put in perspective how you that, look at the world. That's what makes it insurable, right? A risk needs to be random yet predictable in order for it to be insurable. So for example, I would argue that uh, sea level rise is not insurable because it is not, it is not random, right? Mm -hmm. It is happening constantly. It is incremental. It is ongoing now. Um, the same way I would say uh, we talk about in South Florida, we talk about uh, sunny day flooding, right? Or king tides. King tides are not insurable. They happen at a very predictable cadence and they are not random. They need to be both predictable, so there needs to be some sort of level of, of recurrence, but it also has to happen at a frequency which is, again, not, uh, is, is random. Yeah, and if the, if the Ten Across project turns out to be anything, I hope it, it builds on that thought, that these things are knowable. They're, the, the, what's happening to this is knowable, maybe incremental, occasionally if a hurricane hits, that's a sort of uh, a very significant uh, uh, um, uh, instantaneous event, but how it got there, the effects it was gonna cause are knowable. And Duke, I just a, a quick thought related to what Kaki and Alex have said, uh, and still on your leadership theme and how we organize for leadership on these questions going forward, one of the things that makes this era more difficult, and I think this is something that will be uh, forever into the future, is the nature of technological change, particularly in communications, so that people are getting atomized information from a lot of different sources and generate completely different opinions about the same thing in a just almost unmanageable form. And it makes the leadership job more and more difficult, which I think is some of what we're confronting right. today. So the uh, emphasis, there, there needs to be almost a secular faith in putting forward the facts, educating the public, basing it on uh, rational data like business risk information. And one of the theses of this risky business task force that I was on that was pulled together by uh, Mayor Bloomberg and Hank Paulson, the form, former Secretary of Treasury, looking at the, the, the business risk issues is that, that, that people tend to believe that business is gonna act in their interest and if they say there's a problem, there probably is a problem. Mm -hmm. So it, it brings a kind of a rational, serious, mature maturity to, 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 a, to a problem. My point is that uh, one of the critical ingredients of leadership today is getting the information out, getting information that people can really mull over and, and, and believe and even in this era of fake news attacks and all the rest of it, uh, we have to believe that there is a kind of a, a core truth that can be explained if you uh, take measures to, to educate the public. And forums like this are part of that process. They don't go far enough, obviously, in that we have a lot of leadership in the room, but not the general public. And the likelihood that we can get the word out to the general public from a meeting like this is not great. So a new obligation of leadership is to find the technologies that allow us to communicate with the public about these serious questions.
So you're taking me somewhere faster than I thought I would get, but I'm going to go there anyway. Uh, but both Kaki and Alex have brought up government. You've been there, done that. Talking about communications, leaderships, facts, I mean, how distressing is it for you to observe what we might be seeing on the federal level with regard to confidence in our institutions that would alert us to what we collectively need to do to press forward? Oh, it's more than alarming. It's, 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 it's nearly, I'm desperate, I'm panicked. I'm, I'm, I'm depressed. You spend an entire lifetime, you know, uh, working in within a sort of a consensus about what progress is and what social progress is and what uh, justice is and what fairness is and what equality is. And then you see some basic tenets undercut. It really is painful. But the only uh, thing I, I, the only response I can give is that you stay the course on things you believe and that we will get through this and that we're going through a sort of a temporary fever uh, that will break at some point. Uh, it's unfortunate from my experience that, uh, well, fortunate or fortunate, unfortunate, depending on how you see it, but leadership makes a huge difference. I've seen this over and over again in my life where there's an issue, and when a leader takes a stand, it actually moves the needle, and a lot of people go there. And I think that's some of what we're experiencing right now. So leadership makes a difference, but it's not the whole thing. It really is some of these other things like the, the way we communicate today, the coarseness of our dialogue, uh, the, the, some of the you know, sort of continuing prejudices in the society, and, 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 uh, and then people who are really, really aggrieved and, and not willing to trust institutions or the voices of traditional leadership. So we have a big job to do in the country and it's more than alarming, I, in my view, it's actually dangerous because we're undercutting tenants that have been essential to our society, which are gonna be difficult to rebuild. And the younger generations are listening and watching, so we may be doing some really permanent damage for a long time. I hate to go off on that kind of a tangent, but. Uh, and I'm sorry to have provoked you, but I had to ask that question <laughs> at some point. And we'll, we'll come, Alex, please. I, was, I, I would just add, I, so, to be clear, from, from my perspective, the science is not up for dispute, right. right? The facts are not up for dispute. Our shareholders permit us to put their capital at risk against all kinds of different scenarios, and they require us to charge accordingly for it. And if you just look, again, look at the numbers, the financial data, forget the two, de two degrees Celsius by 2100, one meter of sea level rise, look at the financial data, it exists and it's real. But maybe I can put a silver, silver lining on the federal situation, right? Um, I would say that that created a tremendous opportunity at the state and local level mm -hmm. for leadership to really step up. I truly believe that these challenges will not be solved at the federal level. They will be solved on a regional or local basis. Right? So as soon as the president announced that he was gonna withdraw from the Paris Accord, you immediately had 14, 15 governors across the country form the Climate Alliance. Mm -hmm. You see mayors across the country uh, taking leadership. You saw Mitch, Mitch Landrieu from New Orleans running the, the US Conference of Mayors and taking a very aggressive stance on this particular topic. Um, and I would argue that more progress has been made in the last 11 months on this topic than would otherwise have been made had he not made that, made that withdrawal. Th that's very interesting. Kaki, did you want? No, well, I was just going to uh, pile on. Is so the <laughs> TNC works at the city level, the state level, you know, the, the national level, and then, of course, in Global Forum. And the, 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 the level of government that is functioning best, hands down, is the cities. Hands down, just like, because I'm sure the mayor could tell us, it's just like, you don't fix problems, you're not staying in office. <laughs> and so it's, uh, but I think Alex's point is right. It's just like, you know, it's it when the feds create a vacuum, it, you know, the cities and the states can rise up and meet it. These are great points. And, and uh, thank you for the silver lining. It, it makes me feel better already. <laughs> but it's we, want also, you, we want you to go away from this meeting very happy. Yeah, I, I've accomplished something already by being here. Uh, the, the, um, 
uh, my, my chief of staff when I was at HUD uh, is a fellow named Bruce Katz, who many of you know because he later ran the Brookings Institution's Metropolitan Center, created it and built it into something significant. He's just written a new book based on his travels around the country, and it's called The New Localism. And it basically makes your point. So much innovation is happening at the local level on critical questions that we otherwise would have thought of as uh, national or global, but really important work is being done. And it's not to be dismissed, because when it's aggregated together, it can make a difference. So uh, I, I'm a city person. As a matter of fact, the, the initiative for this had to do a lot with my love of cities and, and urbanism and the fact that mayors are problem solvers and we're going to find uh, innovation. I think they are the laboratories of democracy at the moment. However, if you look at the folder that you have on 10 across, these big issues of globalization, of water, of air quality, of energy, of immigration, they don't really care about political borders. They particularly don't care about state borders, I would say. Thus, we're looking at, at a, an area that cuts across the entirety of the conference, while we, uh, con uh, the continent. While we have a lot of confidence in mayors and cities, some of these issues uh, exceed those boundaries. And, and Kaki, you mentioned scale. Some of these problems are maybe understandable in terms of the response we might see at the federal or other levels. They seem so big. What are we going to do? And probably when we've all been confronted with that personally, you go into a bit of a panic, and then you come out of it, and then you actually attend to the issue. I sort of feel like we're in that moment. When you think about the scale of the issues you take on at TNC and where you think you're going to be most effective, how do you make that assessment? What are the boundaries of a problem? Well, so I'll stay with the theme of, uh, of uh, the next session and stick with the Colorado and the Mississippi River. So multi-state jurisdictions. You know, the Colorado at least has the compact uh, that helps keep those states organized. But you want to see th this group of states shares the same water source and they understand that they're bordering on a crisis. Um, and so it helps to crystallize the mind when you have a crisis looming. <laughs> and so, and they solve it together or it doesn't get solved. And so, there's an opportunity of one is working, you know, to bring the states together, but then also working within the state context um, and trying to align the context within those states because they're all different. And the same thing with the Mississippi River, you know, so we work in about 18 different states up and down the Mississippi River on flooding issue and ag sustainability issues. And you can break down the problem via science, like where are most of the nutrients coming from that end up in the Gulf of Mexico and then it's just like so, and then you focus our efforts there, you know, and so Iowa is trying to get a funding source um, to help deal with ag sustainability ability issues. And so the entire conservancy realizes we have to get I will passed if we want to protect the Gulf of Mexico. And so you break down the problem, you look for those opportunities where you're going to have the biggest impact for the watershed as a whole. And so I will is the name of the ballot initiative. It's not just about Iowa. It's about the Mississippi River and about the Gulf of Mexico. And the nice thing about the conservancy and our scale and being in 50 states is we can see that and figure out where are the opportunities greatest and then how can we allocate resources um, to help you know, bring people together to solve them. And you obviously see yourselves as having a special role because you are not in government, but you are aware of government you trespass all over the place, meaning you don't look at those boundaries and you look at the thing as a whole in well, a good way. Yes, trespass in a good way. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's, uh, yeah, absolutely. Somebody's got to do that. Yeah, well, no, and that's, that's the beauty, beautiful thing about uh, the networked approach and the conservancy in that we have 50 state chapters, we right. play in all the states, we have boards of trustees, you know, it's just like, so we know the politics in yeah. each place and right. know like where you can drive them together and how you can look across. And so it's, um, we are particularly well built to look across states, across localities, to try to f see those bigger issues, see those bigger trends and to try to intercede in the system at where we think it can make the biggest difference in the system and not just about that place. Duke, one of the really difficult things uh, about alliances and partnerships that include advocates and nonprofits like the Nature Conservancy and others with government and then with business is finding the common ground. How do you find the middle ground when everybody is trapped either by their constituency that has certain expectations of the position they will take and hold forever and ever or 
uh, business realities that business says, well, we just can't go there. That, that's too costly a measure. We have to give up too much. So how you, how you introduce a sense of compromise, a sense of middle ground, I think is getting harder in our society because we are so atomized, but essential. I mean, that is, I think Mary Landrieu, former senator, would tell you, I mean, that, that's, that's one of the toughest things to achieve in Washington when people are pulled by, you know, the relationship with the PAC and the fact that they're going to get a primary opponent, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But it applies to these larger multi-state and regional issues as well. Breaking down the a fierce loyalty of tight constituencies and business realities and such and finding something that begins to resemble a compromise. It's a dirty word in our, in, in, in our world today, but it's the only way we ever got things done. Mm -hmm. And it needs to be in, reintroduced as, as you know, an, an element of how we proceed. So, so Alex, you, people know your company, know what you do, but you've also been involved with the Rockefeller Foundation and 100 Resilient Cities. Tell us about the relation between uh, the perspective uh, of the private and, and in this case, uh, sort of nonprofit sector coming together around these issues. Yeah, sure. So uh, a number of years ago, about a, a little over a decade ago, Swiss Re was thinking through the issues that we do see at the government level. And there is a role within the private sector that's very common amongst large corporations. It's called a chief risk officer. And so we wrote a paper uh, which we were looking effectively at the concept of sovereign risk management, right? That there should be someone at the highest levels within government to be able to look across all of the various agencies and silos and be able to drill down in and figure out where are the redundancies and where are the inefficiencies in the system and where can there be better collaboration. Um, and after Hurricane Sandy happened, um, the New York State uh, Commission got together to look at this, and one of the topics that they advocated for was that New York State should have a chief uh, risk officer. Well, they don't. Uh, they don't yet. Uh, but Rockefeller Foundation kicked off the 100 Resilient Cities Initiative the, the, the following year in 2013, and they're just now celebrating their uh, five-year anniversary. Um, and as one of the first uh, partners of 100 Resilient Cities, and I know we've got a number of the chief resilience officers here today from all over the world, so congrats to you guys for organizing that. I, I'm not really sure how you pulled that off. Um, and all of these guys are in very different cities, but they all have very uh, similar challenges, and they are sharing their best practices uh, across. And I gotta say, I've learned a ton uh, from this group of individuals. I, I gotta tell you, I thought I was gonna be teaching them. They've really taught me. Uh, one of the best lessons I ever got was from, uh, from Mitch Landrieu when I said, oh, you guys, should just, you guys should just buy insurance. Insurance will solve all your problems. And he said in his, in his very thick accent, he's a thick accent to me, he said, he said, Alex, he said, if I have six feet of water in my city and you hand me a check for $100 million, I still have six feet of water in my city. You haven't solved my problem. So he's really forced us in the context of this, uh, this group to figure out how do we as an industry actually create solutions that provide value? What a novel idea, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and we're seeing that now, and it's completely changed the way I think about how we actually try to uh, partner with these governments, and, and we've really developed some really fascinating uh, structures around the globe using technology, but also listening to the problem. Right, right. Uh, very disappointed to have that image of you going in the mayor's office with your briefcase saying, just buy more insurance. You know, that's Alex, we've got you up here for other reasons. I, yeah, I know. <laughs> I still now, have a job to do. You also mentioned to me once that, that uh, it's not just the six feet of water, because that's the obvious problem literally on your doorstep. It's how quickly will your economy bounce back. Yeah. That's so crucial to long-term sustainability and resilience. Yeah, right. something you're thinking. So, so the speed of recovery absolutely dictates the quality of recovery. Uh, and we see this time and again across the globe, but, but certainly here uh, in the United States. And so when we think about the role of the private sector in helping recovery, when we purely think from the financial perspective, but we also think about the federal government, right? If the message isn't abundantly clear to everybody in this room and more broadly, that the federal government has now found themselves in a position where they believe that it is an unsustainable track, right? If you look at the number, the average number of presidentially declared disasters during the Reagan administration per year, 28. Last year, first year of the Trump administration, 
137 presidentially declared disasters for FEMA, right? The federal government is being spread too thin. FEMA has just released their strategic plan uh, for the next five years, and their number one objective is to transfer more of the risk off the back of the federal government into the local economies where the risk is actually born. So the res responsibility is, is shifting downward. We have to think not only about the public infrastructure, obviously vulnerable populations and making sure that they have the resources they need to recover, but we also need to be thinking about the long-term viability of our economies when so much of everything that we do is backed by bond obligations, right? Our capital plans, our visions for the future are all backed by debt and the opportunity created by raising revenue. Well, if you're like New Orleans and you had your population drop by 50% after Hurricane Katrina and still 13 years later is not quite at its pre-Katrina population numbers, that is almost a generation of revenue that has been evaporated and all of the opportunity that would theoretically have been created by that revenue stream is gone forever. That is not recoverable by FEMA, that's not recoverable under traditional insurance mechanisms, but I truly believe, again, because of the conversations we've been having, that this is absolutely something that the private market can take on. Kaki, is it, is it for these reasons where economies come into uh, play with regard to the systems that you're looking at more, more obviously, that the TNC, the Nature Conservancy, has taken a closer look at cities, that, that you're focusing a bit more on urbanism because it contains many of these issues, maybe in their highest relief? Well, yeah, and just, you know, there's a mega trend around the globe of urbanization. So what, 75% of the people are gonna live in cities within the next 20 years? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's extraordinary. And, um, you know, and we just feel that nature can be part of the solutions of making cities more livable and dealing with some of the challenges, such as um, flooding. You know, it's just like, wouldn't you rather have like ballparks and soccer fields and parks flood than houses? Like you can design park systems in cities to help with the quality of life and also deal with um, flooding, because you know the water is rising in this area. The, um, the issues of risk, I think, are absolutely fascinating. Um, and how, you know, how our society decides to deal with those issues, to get back to the risk issue, is, you know, so, you know, more of the risk going down to the people experiencing the risk, like forcing, you know, moral hazard and all of that is like I'm, I'm in favor of from a policy perspective. But the issue is that sometimes we try to shift that risk too far, too fast to people who didn't cause the problem, but bear the costs of the risk. And are often the most vulnerable. And that's what I'm saying, is there's often an equity issue associated with this. You know, it's just like people live in uh, lower level areas and flood zones because they tend to be cheaper. And it's just like, so you're gonna jack up their rates? It's just like, well, wait a second, that doesn't seem right. And so it's, um, these, these issues of risk, I think, are important for us to deal with because I think it begins to create more of um, uh, economic pressures for people to address the risks at hand. But how we allocate that risk, I think, has to be very thoughtful and, um, and done equitably. Duke, just to pick up on a couple of fact points the, to buttress, um, Kaki's point, for the first time in the history of mankind in 2011, more people now live in urban areas in the world than in rural areas. Uh, most of the continents of the world are now more urban than rural. Africa is one of the, ex is the exception, but it is urbanizing rapidly and that, that it will hit that threshold as well. Asia, for example, China now has a hundred cities over a million people. By 2030, they will have 200 cities over a million people. Uh, and it, so we're seeing this, and in the United States, we're clearly uh, an urban nation now. 65% of the American people live in just the 100 largest metros, of which there are thousands, but just in the first 100, 65% of the population and that contains 75% of GDP production in those 100 largest metros. So we, uh, a good part of the, of the dynamic of the country is urban and a, and a number of the solutions are gonna to have to be urban. Mm -hmm. Let me also pick up on, the, on, on points that both Alex and Kaki made about the, the funding issues. Um, 
it, it's, it's clear that for localities and states to be able to act on many of these questions, they will need different sources of capital because there simply isn't enough debt capacity, either statutorily or just in terms of what they can manage uh, in terms of debt. I'm in, a, in the public finance business, and I, part of our job is to help communities raise capital for financing, but there are limitations on how, how, how that mechanism is, is it gonna be available into the future. So we have to find ways in order to deal with what's called infrastructure, broadly, uh, to bring private capital to infrastructure solutions, which include many of the things that have to be done to deal with climate change, water issues, and so forth. A hard thing to do. One form of private capital will be things like pension systems, insurance companies, and others who want sort of bond-like long-term returns, and, and that can be achieved in certain infrastructure projects. But the other is to actually figure how to uh, monetize the, uh, th those, resort those, those uh, projects so that real private capital, private investment, can be brought to solving many of these things. We have a $2 trillion gap in, in our infrastructure needs. Our infrastructure gets a D, a grade of D, from the American Council on Civil Engineering. And we have 65,000 uh, bridges structurally deficient, massive water issues as we saw in Flint, et cetera. Um, and, and, and we haven't figured how to bring private capital to this, but there isn't enough public capital to do it. You know, it's interesting, uh, this setting could not be better as you look at the enormous bridge there and the 10 right outside the window. Surely though, there's a role for the federal government that, that can't, we can't completely retreat from for some of these things. Yes, things can, can be pushed down to those who are closest to the issue, cities and others, but do you believe that the federal government, and there's talk of infrastructure. There may not be a role for the federal government in the traditional sense in that they have no money. Mm -hmm. the, the deficit is, in, is, is huge into the future. Right? The president advanced an infrastructure plan which was a trillion dollar initiative, but 200 billion of it was federal money. Right. 800 million was match it, find it where you can. Right. Uh, not a role yeah. that is up to the, to the it's, solution. It's but do you, th do you think that finding some additional capital, such as looking at, at how uh, much we pay for gasoline in our cars, which and, and the, uh, the addition that goes with that hasn't been raised since what, the, the 80s or 90s? You know, there, there, there are funds available, I think. We're choosing not to tap them. Is that fair? Absolutely correct. Okay. You, you were shaking well, your head. Well, I mean, the federal government certainly has to play some sort of a coordinating role. But I would also argue, I think, uh, to his point, is that uh, there is capital that is sitting on the sidelines mm -hmm. that can and should be deployed. So if you look at just the insurance industry, forget the rest of the financial services industry, the insurance industry has $30 trillion of assets under management, ready and willing to be deployed to investable projects, mm -hmm. right? And infrastructure is a key topic, obviously. Uh, good infrastructure reduces our exposure, uh, as it does the rest of society. Um, and so we need to figure out how to create investable asset classes, uh, specifically in the infrastructure space. If I can go back one, one uh, second to the urbanization point, um, very clearly a risk anywhere is a risk everywhere now. Right? So if you feel pain in one location, it will likely exacerbate itself elsewhere. Cities are important. We have 1.4 million people moving from rural settings into urban settings every single year. But to your point about the uh, federal government and the concept of a zero-sum game and lack of compromise, we cannot and should not think only about the future of cities, but also the future of rural areas. Because when those economies are stressed, they move to the cities in droves, not just here in the US, but across the entire globe. And when that happens, that puts urban infrastructure under duress. And they also, in many respects, are the canary in the coal mine. If you look at the Syrian uh, crisis, the civil war that's happening in Syria, it is because uh, predominantly, and of course there are other things going on, but predominantly related to water issues in rural populations which lost economic opportunity, and then you had them moving into other parts of, uh, uh, into more urban centers and there was conflict. If I can give you one uh, anecdote, if you'll, if you'll humor me, on, on that type of a challenge and where the private market comes in. So a couple of years ago, the government of Kenya approached us and said, we have this really unique challenge where we have 
large populations of pastoral herders. These are low-income populations that own four or five cattle, and that is their entire livelihood. And when there are droughts, these pastorals have to move to find other grazing land. And when they do that, they, they, they uh, go into other tribal territories, and it leads to political violence. And we have hundreds, if not thousands, of people die every single year simply because they're trying to move their cattle to water. Can the insurance industry design a solution to pre uh, prevent that from happening? Okay, that seems like a really crazy idea. But what we're doing now is using satellite data. We can actually calculate the lushness of vegetation. If it's really green, we know that the cows have plenty to eat and drink. And we know that the pastoralists are gonna stay where they are. As soon as it starts varying shades of yellow into brown, we know that there's a drought ensuing. They're gonna start moving their cattle. They're gonna put themselves and their livestock at risk. So now, using blockchain technology, we're moving funding directly to their mobile phones to, uh, so to provide them with the funding necessary to buy feed and water for their cattle so they stay where they are. And they've actually seen a precipitous drop in the political violence. People are not losing their livestock. What a novel idea, again, of the insurance industry stepping forward and saying, paying for something before the loss occurs. Right. Right? And so directionally, I think that that's where the private market can actually step in and prevent these bad things from happening. I think Alex makes a really important point on the linkage between the urban and rural. Uh, we, we've seen the disaffection even within our own country in rural areas. Much of the politics of the moment is a lot of anger among rural populations, areas that are losing population, getting older, the opioid crisis, lots of evidence of what happens when there's no economic juice getting as far as the rural communities. So while urban is exceedingly important, it is the entry port to the world through our ports, through our airports. As I said, 75% of the GDP of the country is produced in just 100 of our largest communities. Uh, there, we, we need to be thinking smartly about how to create, how as we create prosperity around those nodes, finding its way, some of that opportunity to poor places in the rural hinterland around those metros, a really important point. I think you recognize it well here in Louisiana. And we're gonna have a strategy session after the summit about 10 across, and while you see the 11 major nodes noted on many of the maps that are around here, all those spaces in between have not gone unnoticed by us and how we address them and how we find those linkages between the two. I just wondered, as you're talking about uh, the solutions you were, you were offering, Alex, are you and Khaki in conversation? Are, is TNC thinking how you can talk to an Alex and say, you know, here's an eminently fundable project. We'd like to interest you in that. What's that conversation like? Uh, so we've had a collaboration with Swiss Re for six, seven years now, uh, looking at risk and insurance and how that plays uh, within, you know, uh, nature and conservation. Mm -hmm. So earlier this year, last year, um, we, there was, uh, we issued a product for an insurance product to, on, a, um, on the coral reef uh, in front of Cancun because those provide a lot of coastal protection, uh, coral reefs, um, wave attenuation and all that. And, uh, you know, it's, so it's a start, but it's that that provides a service, an infrastructure service, even though it's a natural one. And so now the hotels are helping to ensure that. So if a hurricane blows through, and Alex will know more of the details of the actual product, is um, there will be money available to help restore the reef. <laughs> so you maintain your coastal defenses, and you maintain you know, the habitat qualities and all of that, um, and uh, tourism. So we've, uh, you know, it's, we've been in exploration with Swiss Re around a lot of these issues. This, is, this has been one of my favorite partnerships uh, that I've gotten to work on over the last 10 years. Um, is it, it actually started looking at the risk reduction value of green infrastructure. So we jointly developed a, an open source model where you can actually look at that. And one of the things that I had noticed in some of the analyses that we did is, is that you can actually reduce the risk of climate change by about 40% on average, just through certain climate adaptation measures. If you look at the full panoply of options in terms of uh, adaptation measures, the ones at least from my very unscientific analysis that had the biggest bang for the buck was always the green infrastructure. Dollar for dollar, they were reducing risk more than any levee or seawall that we could possibly build. Um, and in this particular case, when the TNC, uh, through their own modeling, uh, talking about their science, 
uh, a vibrant coral reef can reduce risk, or reduce the wave energy by 93%. That's pretty remarkable. And at some point, though, when the strength of the storm exceeds a certain threshold, the, the reef begins to deteriorate. And it, it is broken, it is impaired, and it needs to be fixed just like any other asset. Um, and what we found is that if they go and they collect the broken coral within the first 48 hours after the storm, they can actually replant it and increase, again, the speed of recovery of that reef so that its risk reductive value uh, goes back up again. And so the novelty here uh, is not necessarily that we've developed a parametric product which you know, would uh, measure different uh, environmental factors, barometric pressure, wave height, wind speed, to calculate whether a payment is made. The innovation here is the fact that we're able to ensure something that no one actually owns, right? It is providing a societal benefit, and therefore we believe, or we would argue, that the community that is supported by that reef has an insurable interest in its future. So, um, Kaki, it looks like you were going to. Well, offer just one on last the time. infrastructure point, you know, it's just like one of the th one of our big initiatives in the Nature Conservancy is as we think about infrastructure and meeting the infrastructure gap across the country is nature has a role to play as infrastructure because nature is built to last. Yeah. You know, it can be cheaper, it can have great, and it just, and it stays around. It doesn't take the maintenance that it costs. And so we need to rethink infrastructure to incorporate more green elements into, um, into just how we think about the infrastructure. Of Things like country. wetlands and so forth. Wetlands, floodplains, you know, uh, even, yeah, even, you know, out west is forest management. You know, if you wanted to reduce fire risk, you better have healthy forests, and so that's you where your water This comes is a case from. where we know the solutions, but we have to change the systems that get to the solution, because exactly. we're about building pipes and things. That's what we do. We treat infrastructure like a hard infrastructure. Mm -hmm. These things are more subtle. They're, un they're not untested, but they're unknown to some folks and, and how they work. And so getting those uh, solutions into the mix quicker yeah. is what we need to do. Um, so the, the Ten Across project, it cuts across a lot of issues and clearly cuts across a lot of territory. We thought it absolutely important to open up with this existential issue, which is water. And a lot of you in this room are experts either on the geography here, the cities that you're in, the institutions you represent, and or water. Uh, this is not an audience made up of just people who uh, were able to buy a ticket. There are a lot of you in here with great expertise. We would love to open up the floor to questions uh, of our panel here and make this a bit more interactive. I'm, I'm sure there are a few in the audience. Uh, I know some people, uh, I saw nodding heads at various moments. Hopefully you'll step up. But would you have a question for the audience? If not, I've got plenty more. Here we go. Senator Landrieu. Thank you. I have a question. Um, I think one of the biggest um, questions or puzzles that we have to solve is bringing additional capital because I think, Mr. Secretary, you're absolutely right. There is a limit to what the public sector can do and all cities and states and the federal government are stretched, although I do believe when the federal government wants to find money, it figures out a way to do it. <laughs> and, you know, deficit spends for lots of things that are, in my view, less important than what we're talking about here. But let's focus on the answers to what are specific private capital solutions other than private capital coming in for toll roads, which mm. everybody can understand. So when we talk about this, the first thing that pops in my mind, of course, you can build a bridge or a causeway if you put a $5 toll on, but, you know, that has some downsides, of course. Mm -hmm. So could, you, could each one of you or wh whoever take a second to talk about one, two, or three specific private funding solutions, either by giving an example of sure. something that happened or an idea that you might have? I think sectors where you will see the first move of private capital are things like water systems, which can be monetized, obviously water rates, and there's a lot of work on new water uh, 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 treatment facilities and so forth, so water quality related. You will see private capital in airports, and other port-related facilities because those can be monetized. You charge airport landing fees, you charge concessions and so forth at airports, and we need to be, improve our airports all across the country and seaports and things like dredging and uh, preparing them for the larger ships that are coming through the Panama Canal and, 
and, and sea level rise docks and so forth. So those can be done with some private capital. Uh, uh, broadband and communications related infrastructure can be done with private capital. Uh, power, the transition from fossil fuels to renewables, uh, distributive power, a lot of those have private sector opportunities in them, smaller scale solar systems and so forth. So those are some sectors where I think early on we will see uh, private capital. Um, I, I love some of the ideas that have been discussed here today about things that are non-physically built but using nature. And I, there's just some great ideas out there of things that can be done with private capital. There's a lot of capital, as Alex said, on the sidelines that is looking for ways to be deployed. It doesn't have to get 15, 16, 20% hedge fund level returns. It can live with 7 and 8% uh, more bond-like returns and and, and, and it's, it, it, it's available to, for, the right, for the right projects. Does that help? Yeah. Okay. I, I would also add, I mean, I think there's a couple of um, financial structures in the energy space that I actually think make a ton of sense in the risk space. And I'm still, myself, wrapping my mind around how it actually applies. So anybody in the room has great ideas, please share them. But think of the ESCO model. Uh, which is all focused on energy efficiency, right? So you have a private company come into a city, we'll come into Baton Rouge and we'll say, we are going to retrofit all of the street lights in the city from the incandescent light bulbs or the halogen light bulbs. We're gonna put in high efficiency LEDs. We're gonna pay for it. And then you're gonna reduce your annual uh, energy costs by, I don't know, $10 million a year. You're gonna give me 10% of that for the next 20 years. I walk away happy. You haven't shelled that into cash and you're still saving, right? How do we take that exact model and apply it in the water space, right? If we are gonna put in new stormwater systems and it's gonna reduce the actual cost of cleanup and disasters, how do we actually monetize the value of averted losses, right? After Hurricane Sandy, we worked with Mayor Bloomberg to look at the future cost of climate change to New York City, right? And we were able to figure out that today, New York City loses $1.7 billion every single year to, on an annualized basis to hurricanes, by 2050, they'll lose $4.4 billion a year. If we were able to say, with Kaki, we're gonna go in and we're going to build green infrastructure and we're gonna reduce that $1.7 billion number down to $1.2 billion, saving $500 million a year. How do we capture that $500 million of averted losses and actually use that as a potential revenue stream to fund future projects? The, um, hi, Senator, nice to see you again. Uh, though evidently one of the big conversations at Davos this year, at the World Economic Forum, I do not go to Davos, but the CEO, our CEO, Mark Tersick does, was about blended finance. And uh, I know just enough to be dangerous. Um, and it's essentially not like, okay, government's gonna go pay for this infrastructure and private's gonna go pay for that. It's like, how do you marry um, the private capital for the parts of the infrastructure that can be monetized, where do you add on government funding for maybe some of the multiple benefits that can't be monetized? And then when, what is the philanthropic realm here? You know, it's just like they're in the process of rebuilding Detroit now through a lot of philanthropic dollars. And so it's just like, how do you bring the actual money together of the three different sectors and, um, and get the monetization that the private sector needs and then get those additional benefits that the philanthropy and the public sector need, that's, I think, a really intriguing idea. It's like, how do we begin to stack uh, these infrastructure projects and how we get them funded? Great. Uh, another question. Albert. Yeah, I have a question. There's a microphone coming right to you. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. A uh, question for the secretary. Um, when, when you were in office, I think the HUD 203K program was still, or was in operation, which um, gives loans, uh, government-backed loans to individuals to retrofit their home for certain improvements. But, and I'll be talking about this a little later, but the idea of, of flood retrofit and protecting individual homes through the HUD 203K program, what, what do you think about that? I, th I think it's important and needs to be continued. Uh, the idea of retrofitting existing homes f and, and, and preparing for climate change and other things is really important. One area that I've worked on in recent years, nothing to do with uh, environmental issues, but is retrofitting homes for the other tsunami 
that's about to hit this country, which is the aging tsunami and helping people be able to stay in their homes by dealing with things like uh, stair, zero, zero step entrance, uh, uh, fi fixtures inside, toilet fixtures and, and cabinets that are lower for people who may be disabled, wider entrances and, and, and so we, we're having a, I mean, it's a big, big number. The uh, population of people over 65 is about to double and the population of people over 85 is about to triple. Uh, we don't have the capacity to build new things for them or even handled in, in congregate settings and the need is going to be immense to uh, make it possible for people to stay in their own homes uh, and retrofitting much as we did successfully for weatherization is, 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 is something that needs to be done. So the whole idea of retrofitting generally for a variety of reasons, important initiative. Thank you. Another question out there. Hi, I'm Casey Callow. I'm the director of Mobile Baykeeper in Mobile, so I appreciate you being a, being a part of this conference. I kind of have a two-part question, and one is in a state like Alabama, we have an environmental agency that's not as um, forward-thinking, and they do not not only require that you plan for future for sea level rise for climate change impacts when you develop or plan a new development, um, they don't encourage it. I mean, so there's no part of that. So is there a way to get insurance companies to force that change locally? And then secondarily, is there a really good way, because this is a question for all of you really, is is there a way for y'all to enlist local organizations like mine to help drive that conversation or even to help feed information up the stream so that we can be better informed? I don't think you knew that. Don't get me in trouble for telling on Alabama for that one. <laughs> No, I'll give it a shot. Uh, yeah, so I think the insurance industry has a role to play in communicating risk. And so, you know, seatbelts are in cars today because of insurance. Uh, fire extinguishers are in homes because of, of insurance. And you should be seeing that same sort of activity um, when we're talking about climate-related impacts and risk. Uh, the challenge, I would say, that's unique to the United States is that there is not one regulator. In the United States, there are 56 insurance regulators. If you include all the states and all the territories. Uh, insurance is regulated at the state level. Building codes are established at the state and local level. Land use planning is established at the state and local level. And the federal government has absolutely no authority uh, to dictate how that is done, um, right? So the federal government is asked to write the big checks and the state and local government is, uh, is, in, is entitled to make the decisions that they see fit. We can always talk about uh, the impact of the decisions they make on our ability to offer reasonable, affordable, available products in the region, um, and hopefully that resonates enough to begin to drive change, uh, but it's slow going in certain, st in certain places. I do think Alabama probably has uh, some of the uh, less uh, advanced building codes uh, when it comes when it comes to risk, but you have some other really interesting stuff happen. There's a great uh, great small company that's been started up called My Strong Home, and they are writing they are writing business in uh, Alabama, in Louisiana, and two or three other states where they are actually embedding risk reduction measures, physical risk reductions through premium finance into the insurance policy. So people are retrofitting their homes effectively subsidized through the insurance mechanism to draw down the risk. And, uh, and I think it's having great success. So it may not happen at the, uh, again, at the state level, uh, but it, it could happen where there's new opportunity at the local level. Yeah, I, um, just one anecdote I know of that it was at a county level in Washington state. So, um, but they were having flooding issues and so this, the county paid for like a $300 million floodplain restoration effort. And it caused the uh, insurance rates of the affected people to go down. And so the people were like, okay, I'll pay more for bonds because I'm gonna save on my insurance rates. And so there are examples where the insurance, there has been that insurance rate signal, which can help provide, I think that, um, that more economic approach to, you know, 
quote unquote doing the smart thing. Um, and so, it, you know, at the state level, maybe not, but you know, maybe at the county level, there's opportunities there. So, so we're about to transition to our uh, next panel. I, I want to ask you in closing, the, the three of you, how we should be thinking about 10 across as an, uh, you, you mentioned maybe the word alliance or something. How do you take a, think about a piece of geography, multiple cities, multiple constituents, multiple uh, ecosystems of, of, of wide variety? Your advice to us about moving this project forward, what would you recommend? Um, well, I'll be happy to start. Um, I believe in alliances. Uh, I was president of the National League of Cities and I saw the value of city leaders coming together and thinking creatively about things, even though they come from very different sizes and very different types of cities. And then I've seen alliances on a regional level like compacts in the Northeast, several in the Rust Belt and in the Heartland Midwest to deal with industrial issues, water alliances in the West. So almost, there's something about the way we work in a democracy in America that people like the idea of coming together with others who are share and, and share ideas. And almost any linkage will, will work. A 10 is in some ways a kind of a artificial linkage because the places are so, so very different from the West all the way to Jacksonville. But, I mean, you've made a really, you've done a really good job of finding the linkages. Uh, and I was thinking earlier when I said, you know, four of the 10 largest cities in America. I mean, think of the relevance of having three states, which happen to be the number one, number two, and number three most populous states in America in California, Texas, and Florida. So um, there's a lot, of a lot of weight here. There's a lot of bulk, I think, the substance that, that, that allows this to hold together. Uh, I, I think you're going to have to, I think it was good to choose water as a focal point. There are others that you will want to choose. Really court the nonprofit sector and the civic sector in each of the places along the way. I think it's a, I mean, the attendance at this conference, the interest, the substance speaks already to the value of the idea. When I said a brilliant idea, I, I mean it. I think the country cries for um, ways to bring people together to, to, to work on common solutions. Any suggestions, Alex? Kaki? I would just say keep in mind that this is a shared challenge, right? And it's the same problem, right? It's obviously a very vast geography, which seemingly different problems, but they're not, this, they're not different problems. They're the same problem, right? It may be hurricanes here. It may be drought over there. It's the same problem, and the solutions are actually quite similar. The second point I would make is as you move forward, maintain this idea of risk ownership, right? This is a local, regional problem, and if you come at it from the mindset that this is your problem to own, you'll come up with better implementable solutions because if you don't own the risk, the assumption is that someone else is going to deal with it. Uh, just briefly, as I would, as we've noticed, the issues can be very different, but I do think this is the leading edge of a lot of issues in America. And that it's not, but it's not about the technical differences. It's about the fact that we're going to, it's about the alliances and the partnerships and how you get complicated geographies to work together toward a shared purpose. And so that is going to come up regardless of the issue and the place you are is just like, what is the next generation of American democracy look like? And um, you know, this, these are the types of forum I think that need to happen to make that a reality. Well, I hope you all thank our panelists. Uh, we really appreciate your remarks and your insights. Thank you very much.